We learned in lecture 4.2 that resistance causes dissipation of electric energy. The energy is dissipated into heat in the process called Joule heating. This lecture will solely focus on the physical aspect of resistance, such as how to compute resistance in a piece of wire, and how a resistance accumulates when a few resistors are arranged in series or parallel. A piece of physical wire in reality carries resistance, regardless whether the wire is made of conducting or insulating material. Of course, if it is made of conducting material, it is able to conduct electricity better than if it is made of insulating material, meaning that a conductor has less resistance than an insulator. But that makes the whole definition of conductor versus insulator a little subjective, isn't it? How conductive should a material be before it can be called a conductor? Or how resistive should a material be before it can be called an insulator? Well, there is actually a quantity that measures the conductivity or resistivity of a material objectively. That quantity is called resistivity. It is denoted by the Greek alphabet rho. The higher this rho value is, the more resistive the material is. So as you can see, we do expect to see metals such as silver, copper, and aluminium among the conductors. They have relatively low resistivity, which means they are good conductors. On the other end of the spectrum, we see materials such as glass or wood being good insulators as indicated by the high resistivity value. But resistivity is not the only quantity that determines the resistance property of a material. The size, or what we technically call the dimension of the material, does matter as well. Let's say we are given a piece of material, a rod with length L and cross-sectional area A, to mimic the shape of a wire. Then empirical study shows that resistance of the material is given by the resistivity of the rod times the length of the rod divided by the cross-sectional area of the rod. Longer wire carries more resistance than shorter wire of the same material. Thinner wire also carries more resistance than thicker wire of the same material. Needless to say, wires made of different material possess different resistance. I'm not sure if this helps, but I remember when I learned this equation myself for the first time as a student many years back, I used to draw an analogy between this equation to walking or driving. Imagine you are trying to walk from one end of the road to the other end. Things around you, other people standing by, lampposts, road dividers, etc. were obstacles. Then wouldn't you agree with me that going across a narrow street full of obstacles is more challenging than going across a wider street with the same number of obstacles? It's even more tiring if the street seems like has no end. In that sense, thinner wire carries more resistance than thicker wire, and so does longer wire of a shorter one. Driving on asphalt is definitely easier than driving on gravel road of the same width. In that sense, we say that gravel road carries more resistance or higher resistivity than asphalt road. Now, of course, by no means this analogy constitutes a rigorous definition of the resistance equation. If you wish to argue that my analogy is far from accurate, <laughs> be my guess. If you don't like the analogy or you can think of a better analogy, so be it. It is merely a tool to help appreciate and remember the equation. Alright, we have now learned how to compute resistance in a piece of wire from the characteristic of the wire. So in theory, if, say you need a 10 ohm resistance for your electronics, you can buy a roll of copper wire from Simlin of Funan, look out for resistivity of copper from the table before, Measure or find out the cross-sectional thickness of the wire, compute the needed length of the wire to give you 10 ohms, and cut the wire accordingly. You will need a 581 meter long of copper wire to have the effect of 10 ohm resistance. Wow, half a kilometer of wire needed. Of course, what I'm trying to say is, it does not make sense to build resistance this way. Instead, you should buy those already made readily available resistors which come with specific resistance value as indicated by the color codes on the body of the resistors. Since these resistors are manufactured in bulk with those specific but standard resistance values, most of the time we may not be able to get the exact resistance required for our electronics directly from the shop. The solution is, we have to mix and match those resistors to give off the resistance that we need. We can arrange the resistor either in series or in parallel. Let's start with the former. When in series, the resistors are placed one after another in such a way that the same current that originates from the battery flows across all the resistors. We can compute this current using Kirchhoff loop rule. Reading the circuit clockwise starting from here, the potential difference across R1 is given by I times R1. Do not forget the negative because the current flows from the higher to lower potential, resulting in negative potential difference across the resistor. We talked about this at length in the previous video. 
Subsequently, the potential difference across R2 and R3 are given by negative I times R2 and negative I times R3 respectively. While the potential difference across the battery is positive V, because the current flows from the anode to the cathode end of the battery. This four terms should amount to zero as dictated by kirchhoff loop rule. We tidy up the equation and take the common factor I out. What we shall notice next is that we can treat all the resistors as an equivalent resistor whose resistance is given by the sum of individual resistance in each resistor. In general, if there are n number of resistors in series, the equivalent resistance is simply given as such. The derivation is slightly more complicated in parallel situation. When in parallel, each resistor will experience different current flow across it. However, these currents are related to each other and the original current from the battery in a manner dictated by Kirchhoff junction rule. We can also compute these currents using Kirchhoff loop rule for each loop consisting of each resistor and the battery. So from the first loop involving R1 and the battery, we have V equal to I1 times R1. From the second loop involving R2 and the battery, we have V equal to I2 times R2. And from the third loop involving R3 and the battery, we have V equal to I3 times R3. Notice that the potential difference across each resistor is the same. Just now, when we are dealing with resistor in series, the potential difference across each resistor is different, but the current that flows across the resistor is the same. In parallel case, it is the other way around. The potential difference across each resistor is the same, but the current that flows across the resistor is different. If we then treat all the resistor as a whole, as an equivalent resistor, we can write the following equation. What we are going to do next is purely algebraic manipulation. Our intention is to express the equivalent resistance in terms of the individual resistance R1, R2, and R3. Notice how the equation from Kirchhoff junction rule and Kirchhoff loop rule are used in the derivation. In general, if there are n number of resistors in parallel, the equivalent resistance is simply given as such.